Again, good morning. Uh, we hope that Justin is feeling better. He's feeling under the weather this week. Uh, sound man is not here today, so we're doing the best we can. Uh, maybe a, a C, C minus on the sound we're doing. Uh, Leah's doing a good job for us back there. So I hope you're enjoying our journey through Genesis as much as I am. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible, as I've said umpteen times before. With all of its rich stories and narratives in it, uh, the title of this morning's message is A New Name, A Great Name. Abram has been promised a son, a son from his own body, a son made with his barren and now past childbearing aged wife, Sarai. And that's exactly how God had told them in chapter 16 that he would do it with those two people. A man advanced in years with his barren, advanced in years wife, and they would be the parents of what would become a great nation. And we saw the last two weeks in our study of Genesis how Abram and Sarai got the proverbial cart before the horse and attempted to speed up God's plan. And the truth is, Abram and Sarai simply made up a plan of their own. How many times is God leading us uh, in the way that he wants us to go, and we somehow make up a plan on our own that we think this is going to be what God wants? Um, the result of that ill-conceived plan that Sarah and Ab uh, Abram had come up with was the boy Ishmael, the son of Abram, but with the servant woman, Hagar. Ishmael, as we said last week, would grow up to be the father of the Arabic people, and uh, his descendants are here with us even you know, today in the world. Um, it's interesting to note, too, though, Ishmael, um, is, uh, his father is Abram, but his mother is Hagar, his, his father was from the line of Shem, who is the, who is the uh, favored line that the Messiah will come from. But his mother, Ishmael's mother, is Hagar, and she's from the line of Ham. So you see that, uh, and also you remember in our study of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, that Ham was the one that was um, cursed by God. All that to say God is faithful and he comes through on every great promise that he makes and he does it every time. In his own time, not our time. God has never forgotten us. He's never forgotten you. He has never forgotten his promises to his people and God always delivers. So we see in Genesis chapter 17 this morning, if you'll turn there, I think it's also on the screen. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8 this morning. And again, I've mentioned this uh, a few months back, a few weeks back. A lot of teachers, a lot of pastors would just kind of take this as one massive chunk. They might do one chapter in one day. Sometimes I'm able to do that. Uh, some pastors might take three or four or five chapters in just one sermon and just kind of hit it. Uh, just skim over the top. What I want to do is just, uh, as we've been doing with our study of Genesis, is just taking it piece by piece by piece so that we can just digest this and really understand what the Lord would have us uh, gain from it. So Genesis chapter 17, uh, 1 through 8. And now it happened that when Abram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and so that I may confirm my covenant between me and you, and that I may multiply you exceedingly. And then Abram fell on his face, and God spoke to him with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. And no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. 
and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will go forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and between your seed and after you throughout your generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your seed after you. And I will give to you and to your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin this morning. Father, thank you for your wonderful scripture that we are able to pour over each Sunday morning. We pray that uh, we would do this each day, that we would love the word that you have given to us. Go with us now. Illuminate our hearts and our minds, Holy Spirit. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So this morning, in order to fully grasp the heart of Abram and his feelings, his emotions, we need to look at the blank space, go back uh, one verse from Genesis 17. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 16, verse 16, probably there on the same page with you in your Bibles. And uh, we're going to look at what is, could be called a blank space. In Genesis 16, 16, Abram is 86 years old, and he's just fathered Ishmael. Now in Genesis 17, 1, which is one verse later, and remember, in the, up until the 1500s, 1600s, there were no chapter and verses in the Bible. These words, these sentences just ran together. And at one point, there were no periods or anything like that in all of Scripture. So we've added those periods to make it make sense to us. All that to say, now in Genesis 17, 1, Abram is 99 years old. In uh, one verse, he jumps 13 years. But we want to look really quickly at what those 13 years are were, they would have had to been long. They would have had to been difficult for Abram. Years of waiting and hoping, questioning, confusion, all of these emotions in a, in a cycle repeated over and over again. And, and many times you may have felt this way. When you start wrestling with things, if you're like I am, Many times you kind of you have to you have to let it cook in your heart, as I say. You have to let it cook in your mind. Uh, these thoughts, these emotions, and many times we go over and over something that we're planning on doing, or is this the right thing to do? And we are excited about it, and then we're concerned about it, and then we hope with it, and then we're confused about it, and then we sometimes begin all over again, and we do this two or three times, maybe more when we're wrestling with something. And this is what Abram did for 13 years. 13 years of raising Ishmael, knowing that Ishmael was not God's plan for Abram and Sarai. Uh, Abram must have kept asking himself, uh, did I hear God right? Did, and if I did hear God correctly, where is God? It's 13 years. In fact, it has been 24 years since Abram had been given his great promise by the Lord, and he left Ur of the Chaldeans. And so Moses, the writer here of Genesis, he wants the reader to understand. He wants you to uh, get it this morning, to feel Abram's dismay at what Abram perceived as a delayed blessing. If, in fact, the blessing of a son is ever going to come, in his mind, it had been 13 years of tension in the household between Sarai and the servant woman Hagar as Abram and Hagar raised their son Ishmael. Sarai was a decade younger than Abram. At, she was 89 years old. Abram, he's one year shy of being 100, hitting the century mark, and he's trying to hold on to God's promises. And in these 13 years of waiting on a son of their own, um, God is growing the faith 
of, of Abram and Sarai. And so you see, even in the so-called barren, bleak, dry years, God is still growing their faith in his future work in their lives. And the same for our, our lives, it goes without saying that God is always working in the lives of his people, even in the, the, what you think is the bleak, the barren, maybe you're going through dry years. What is going on? Nothing's happening. I look on social media and everyone else is doing this and I feel like I should be moving forward and my life, Lord, is just dry. What, what are you doing in my life, God? And so we see in these next couple of weeks, Genesis chapter 17 is all about how God once again came to Abram to build up Abram's faith. And, and we will see in this chapter four new names that will be introduced to us. Uh, these four new names, the first one is the name God Almighty. We've not seen that in Genesis before. That's a new name for God, for Yahweh, for Elohim. Uh, we will see the name Abraham. We've seen Abram before. We have not seen Abraham. We're going to see the name Sarah, Sarah, because before we have seen Sarai. And then we will see the name Laughter. Yes, that's the name. That's the name that they're going to name their son, who is, uh, we know him by the name Isaac. And so verse 1, now it happened that when Abram was 99 years old, that Yahweh appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Uh, let's look at this. The, the first name that the Lord called forth in this, this back and forth with Abram was his own name. Uh, in the Hebrew, God Almighty is El Shaddai, El Shaddai, God Almighty. This is the very first time that God calls himself God Almighty in the scriptures. And uh, in our study so far in Genesis, we've seen uh, um, a few different words, but this is the first time we've seen God Almighty. The theologian, the late theologian R.C. Sproul stated that this use of God's name El Shaddai is frequently used in the book of Job and also used to describe God bringing about his promises of offspring to all the patriarchs in the Old Testament. When God begins to talk about their offspring and him making people into a great nation and they say, how do you do this? And he says, I am El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. You know, I used to be a children's leader, a children's minister, a children's pastor. And I, of course, then our kids were young too. And I was always thinking of how I could explain Bible stories, uh, by God's power, God's uh, form to children. And, uh, I come up with these things sometimes in my mind as I'm walking, as I'm praying. How omnipotent and powerful is Yahweh God, the God Almighty? Have you thought of that? How powerful is he? Now, the, the problem of us being human is that all of our experiences are human. And so even when we try to describe deity, God, it always seems to fall short that we, he's like us. He, you know, he's, he's just more powerful than us, but he's, he's like us. We think this way, he must think this way, but you have to look in scripture to, to see who he is. He's omnipotent. He's powerful. He's sovereign. Uh, as I would uh, maybe, maybe not so much children, but I would tell maybe teenagers, I would say, how powerful is God? God could hold one trillion nuclear bombs in his right hand as they detonated, and he would have complete sovereignty over them as he hurled them into the far reaches of the universe. That is powerful. That is massive 
power. And yet, God sees and feeds the red cardinal on a winter's day and causes the lily to sprout on a spring morning. God is, I mean, we, we, we are so in love with him, who he is, and that he loves us so much, and he has called us his own. God Almighty is the name that the biblical patriarchs came to know God as. Exodus 6, 3 says this, I appeared to Abram, Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. And this is when he was speaking to Moses. And this is the same name that is used 31 times in Job to encourage Job in his trials. This name, God Almighty, is most often used in Genesis in relation to descendants, as I said, to the patriarchs. Genesis 49, 25, that we will get to at some point, says this, The Almighty, who will bless you with the blessings of the breasts and of the womb. That's speaking about being fertile and fruitful. But we see that Sarai at this point was anything but that. But wait on God. God is, God is on the way. El Shaddai can do all things. God was telling Abram this, everything, your life and your future in this statement is wrapped up in this statement. I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. So church this morning Family, it is the same for us. If our hope and our faith is in El Shaddai, God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, our future is secure. And no matter what we go through, no matter what anyone can do to us uh, on this earth, our life on earth is secure and our home in heaven is secure. Why would anyone not want to walk with the Lord knowing that? Do you know how much fear is out in the world today? Uh, they are saying that, um, that antidepressants are just at an all-time high because there is so much anxiety and fear in the world. This is with, this is with grown adults their whole lives needing this. Now, and that's not wrong. Many people have been on those. I've been on antidepressants before years ago. Verse 1b says this, God is telling Abram, walk before me and be blameless so that I may confirm my covenant between me and you and that I may multiply you exceedingly. God is about to pour, pour it on Abram. He is about to pour it on. 13 years he's been waiting. But help is coming. Abram was expected to continue in faith toward Yahweh God. And then isn't that the way it is with God's people? He may lead us through a dry time. He may lead us through a time where we question God. But he gives us the faith to hold on. And if you ask any true Christian who's going through even something terrible, is you ask him, is the Lord your God? Oh, yes, he is. Abram was expected to walk with the Lord. And it says that Abram was to be blameless. But that's a question for us. What sinner can truly be blameless? We are sinners. It seems to negate that word in our lives. How could any of us be blameless? But the phrase blameless was also used to describe Noah in his generation. And Job was also described as being blameless. And if you want to know, you know, you look at the life of Job and what had happened, uh, not to go on a rabbit trail onto a sermon of Job, but Job um, was sm smitten by God and he still held on to his faith. Psalm 19, David says, keep your servant also from willful sin and then I will be blameless. Blameless people are those that are not accused of wrongdoing 
uh, before God, they are the ones that walk righteously in what blameless means. The word blameless can also be stated as upright or just. When someone asks, what is that Christian like? What are you like? You would hope that they could say, they're, they're just, they're upright. That man is righteous. That woman, she's blameless. No one can blame that woman <clears throat> for anything. Upright, just, blameless are the words that should describe you and I as members of the Lord's church. We should always seek to do the right thing and in the right situations, in all situations. Walking in righteousness and reflecting God's glory to an unbelieving world. There are many opportunities to do the wrong thing, but there are opportunities to do the right thing. And God's people, we, the church, are called to do the right thing. There was a reason God needed Abram to walk blamelessly. It was so that God would confirm his covenant onto Abram between God and Abram. And in this covenant, Abram would be blessed exceedingly. You want to cheer for Abram at this point. Abram, Sarai, <clears throat> just hold on, hold on. God is on the way. <clears throat> Verse 3, Then Abram fell on his face, and God spoke with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. And no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And here we see just how important a name really is. The Bible itself gives great importance to name giving. And actually name giving is a, is a highly reverent and authoritative act in almost every area of life. You know, most of the time, the naming of a baby boy or baby girl is done with great care and, and great thought in our world because the name signifies who they will be. Uh, interesting, the name Abram had meant exalted father. When he was born in the Ur of Chaldees, his name was <clears throat> exalted father. Everywhere Abram went, people might have asked, exalted father, just how many children do you have? And Abram would have answered after he had had Ishmael, only one son, and that son wasn't even with my wife Sarai. And so verse 5, it says, and no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of of a multitude of nations. And so the name Abraham in the literal Hebrew means father of a multitude. So Abram went from being Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, the father of a multitude. And yet God has changed his name from Abram to Abraham and he still has not had a child of promise with Sarai. So the great, a great illustration here is that every time Abram was addressed by his new name, Abraham, people would say, good morning, Abraham, father of a multitude. Lunch is ready, father of a multitude. Every time somebody addressed him as Abraham now, it would say, father of a multitude, where are you? Father of a multitude, we need the goat's uh, fed, father of a multitude, we need deer meat, father of a multitude. And then God told Abram that kings would come from him. He said in verse 6, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will go forth from you. A great exercise is to look uh, at this section and see all of the I wills that God 
says he will do. I will, I will, I will do this, I will do this. It is all God. This shows us that the blessing of Abram, Abraham and Sarah was all of God. God did it all. Abram and Sarai were just two living souls who kept breathing. The great work was done by God himself through two people in whom God poured out his earthly blessings. And if you look in scripture, it's even in Genesis. Everything that ever that anyone ever receives is all of God. You don't you see in Noah that Noah was a righteous man. God chose Noah God chose Adam and Eve. God, is, God will choose his people to work with because they are imperfect vessels. They are by themselves, they are sinners. Abram and Sarai did not earn God's approval. They weren't exceptional people. Abram was a moon worshiper living in Ur when God called him, which is like all of us. At some point, we get to the age of accountability, and we, we need to come to the Lord at, certain, at a certain time. Uh, usually, that can be you know, around age 10, age 11, 12. But at that point, you've got to come to the Lord. You're being called. So there was a method to God's madness, as we would say. God was intentional in his work with Abram and Sarai. It was to bring to fulfillment the plan where the Savior Jesus would be born from this very people that Abram and Sarai would birth. And 2,000 years later, after Abraham, the Lord Jesus would be born. The, the, the planned, they called Messiah this is what Matthew was describing when he wrote in the opening verse of Matthew 1 in the New Testament. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. The son of Abraham, that's it. And so this morning, I'll close with this hypothesis, this this presentation to you. What if God were doing something in your life today that would have ramifications in the lives of your relatives 2,000 years from now if the Lord tarries? What if God was doing something in your life today calling you to faith because he needs to do a great work in the life of, in your life, in your family's life would that knowledge make you more intentional? Would that knowledge make you more faithful in living a life of faith for God this very day? Here's a few of God's promises to us as I close this morning. And I, I, was, I just kind of jotted these down this morning. I just, they just came to me. But think of all of the promises of God given to his people in the Old Testament. And what about the New Testament? What are the promises that God has given to us? Of course, in the Old Testament, you know, it was a promise, I will give you a son. I will give you a daughter. Uh, your, your son will be a very great man. That's a promise, you know, in, in the Old Testament. But we don't have that today. God doesn't come to individual people in a Christophany anymore. You know, Jesus doesn't appear to somebody at the foot of their bed and say, I'm going to give you a son. We have the word of God that is his revelation to us, so we don't have the appearances of God like this anymore. But there are promises to us that are the promises just like the promises that Abraham and Sarah received, just, just as valid of promises. Uh, some of these promises, uh, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. That's a promise. Some of these are also facts, but they're promises uh, for the Christian, for the faithful, for the one who knows the Lord Jesus as Savior and Lord. To be absent in your body is to be present with the Lord. That's a fact. 
If you're not in your body on the earth, you're going to be with the Lord. Uh, Also, another one, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That's a fact, but it's also a promise that the death of the saints, anytime any Christian passes away, Remember the Lord that I told you about, the God that can hold a trillion nuclear warheads in his hand as they detonate and he can hurl them into outer space? And that same God, when one of his children pass away, that is precious, precious in his sight. Also another one, a promise from John 14 too. This is Jesus just before he went to the cross a promise that we can hang our hat on. I go to prepare a place for you. That's a promise. I mean, just straight up for us this morning, for all the saints for the last 2,000 years, when Jesus left the earth after he had risen from the, uh, from the dead, then he ascended to heaven. He is at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says that he is interceding for us on our behalf. How this works, I don't know, because there is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and yet the Son sits at the right hand of the Father, but they are the same. And yet the Son, Jesus, because he loves his saints, he loves his people, he loves the those that are his in the church, he is at the right hand of the Father constantly, constantly interceding to the Father on your behalf and my behalf. Think about that. Everything that we need, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Father, they need this. They need this, Father. Father, I pray that you would give them this. And next, after he said, I go to prepare a place for you, the next verse says, and if I go to prepare a place for you, here's the next promise, I will come again. And receive you to myself. That is a promise. He said, I am going to come again. And not only that, I am going to receive you to myself. He said, that where I am, there you may be also. He was originally telling the disciples this in the upper room because he was about to go to the cross and he had told them that he was going to have to leave. And They were just befuddled, scared, fearful. Our teacher, our rabbi, the man that we love has said he's going away. Where are you going? Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. They said, we don't know where you're going. How can we get there? And Jesus said, I will come again and receive you to myself. That is a promise for every Christian who has ever lived. I am coming again and I am going to get you and I'm going to take you to be with me. That is, uh, that's so comforting. And another, it says, and if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. John 14, 14. What a promise, a fact, but also a promise If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it for you. What if one of your children asks you, uh, Mom, Dad, I need this. Will you get this? I don't, I'm fearful, Mom, I'm fearful, Dad, that you're not going to be able to do this for me. And you love them so much. And if you know that it is in your power to give them what they need, you would sit them down and calm them and say, listen to me. I am going to get this for you, my son. I'm going to get this for you, sweetheart. This, because I'm your father and I can do it and I promise you I will get this for you. If you ask me anything in my name, Jesus said, I will do it. If it is according to his promise and will. And then, of course, the promises of revelation and, you know, it. we could go for days on that. The second to the last verse in the Bible says this, yes, I am coming quickly. Jesus said that. He said that to John as John wrote wrote that down on the island of Patmos. Yes, I am coming quickly. That is a promise for us. It's a promise. I am coming quickly. 
God doesn't break his promises. Now, we might say, well, he said that 2,000 years ago, and he said he's coming quickly. Sometimes people say, and the way to understand that is when he does begin to come, it is going to happen quickly. Like a flash of a, 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 the flash of an eye, the blink of an eye, the twinkle of an eye. That is how fast the second day of the Lord, the, the great day of the Lord will come. And I close with this, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. Paul is writing this. He's writing this about heaven, about the glory of God. And he says, I has not seen and ear has not heard all that God has prepared for those who love him. What a promise. What a promise. Make you want to, you know, as they say, storm the gates of hell with a water pistol. Uh, I has not seen, we have not seen what God has prepared for us. The things that people have told us about heaven and we've heard it in our ears <clears throat> still doesn't, doesn't work. We can hardly grasp that. All that God has prepared for those who love him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for your word. We look forward to the scripture and our growth in Genesis of what you will do in the life of now Abraham and Sarah. We, we look forward to seeing the birth of the promised son, Isaac. Father, also this morning, we know that you have given us many promises and we pray that we would hide your word in our heart that we might not sin against you. That means pouring over your word, reading your word, having your word in our hearts as we drive to work, as we come home, as we are working, as we're at lunch, as we lay our head down on our pillows at night, that the very last thing that would go through our minds is your promises to us. Oh, how you love us, Lord. And we pray that we would love you the same. We love you so much, Lord. We pray this in Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen.